Hello everyone and welcome to my KSP Advanced Tutorial Series in Kerbal Space Program 1.2. This series is designed to be a follow-up to my KSP 1.1 Tutorial Series which had six videos and covered the basics of career mode, getting to orbit, rendezvous, and stuff like that. This series will cover more advanced topics and you can provide me with your suggestions for what I should cover. But the first thing I wanted to do was talk about the design of a space shuttle and that's because it's a very popular thing to do in Kerbal Space Program. This video will cover the design of a space shuttle as uh, close to the actual STS system, the space shuttle, the American space shuttle that we might be most familiar with, as possible. So, the main engines are going to be on the orbiter. There is not going to be any engine on the external tank, and we will have SRBs as boosters. So that is the general layout. Other than that, uh, we will have tiny little OMS engines for our orbital maneuvers, but no other engines will be used while in orbit, and it is meant for low carbon orbit. Okay, so first thing we need to do is build the orbiter in the space plane hangar, and you might not want an orbiter that looks exactly like the, the American space shuttle. You might want something different, and that's fine. A lot of the principles that we're going to be talking about will carry over. And one thing that you're going to want to do is to just see that it flies properly. You are not going to be using these engines because you'll note that these engines are tilted unless you choose to not tilt them. These are tilted to counterbalance the weight of the external tank. And so they're actually meant to point through the center of mass of the combined orbiter and external tank setup. And the external tank is very heavy on the space shuttle stack and so you're not generally going to use these uh, for anything except for launch they're going to be turned off and not reignited in fact the shuttle does not carry the fuel for these engines in the Kerbal case that's liquid fuel and oxidizer in the case of the real space shuttle was liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen all it carries all the real sh uh, space shuttle would carry is fuel for its OMS engines which is monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide in our case, it's mob propellant. Now, there is one little asterisk. This is actually carrying a little bit of liquid fuel and oxidizer, and that's to run the fuel cells, because, of course, the space shuttle does not have solar panels. So it needs fuel cells in order to replenish its electric charge supply. So we have those. This, uh, I, I should mention, this forward unit, which has the docking port, an extra crew, crew cabin here, is uh, was introduced by Das Valdez. I'm just stealing his idea. And so I refer to this as the Das Valdez docking port arrangement. Das streams on Twitch. And I, I liked this arrangement, so I constantly copy it on my space shuttles. So that is that. And it leaves enough room for oops. It leaves enough room for uh, orange tank, so we can sneak that in here. Just as a test. When we do a full launch, we will have an external tank. So we will have it coupled like that and then we will have an external tank like come on like so so exactly enough room for that also it has the side benefit of making use of the window here if you actually have a Kerbal in here and you go into IVA view you can actually see through this window if you click it in the IVA view, view and then you'll be able to see the contents of the cargo bay which is really nifty okay so the capacity, design capacity for this shuttle will be 36 tons, but we're not going to test that on a flight test. And in fact, I'm not going to do the flight test here, but the way I would do a flight test, and uh, because I want to get on with discussing the rest of the design, and of course we'll be trying to land it in the atmosphere anyway, so you'll be able to see it fly in its more practical sort of situation. But since you're not using these main engines to fly, because they're tilted incorrectly, uh, by the way, they're tilted at a 10 degree angle. And the way you want to do that is, assuming you want to use the same setup as the space shuttle, is you want to go into snap mode, rotation, click it, hold down shift, and then holding down shift you get increments of 5 degrees. So 5, 10. So two clicks. Okay, so... Yeah, and these little engines are not powerful enough, so what you would want is some sort of jet engines. And when I did flight test them, uh, flight test this, it was really, really rough because it's, um, it's quite a burly beast and it flies like a brick as you might expect. 
so we would have the couplers on the side here. And you can choose your preferred method for doing this, but just have the decouplers, liquid fuel tanks. Um, I used the whiplashes. And of course, uh, symmetry, two of them, and then air intakes. And I didn't fuel it fully because when it's landing, it's not going to have all of its fuel, so we would have some of the mop bunk gone and so forth. And yeah, that barely gave enough power to lift off of two of them and you know fly around a little bit and then see if it could land safely. And that's about it. Maneuvering is very important too. It should be able to turn at low speeds. And you can decouple them off and get rid of them though. They tend to knock into the wings, so you gotta watch out for that. Okay, as far as what I actually did here, this is actually one of the cylinder-fied monopropellant tanks. This is an NCS adapter without liquid fuel. And then, of course, two more RCS fuel tanks. Remember, the only fuel that this is carrying, really, is monopropellant. And you can see that with uh, empty cargo bay and full monopropellant load, the amount of Delta V it has is about 450, let's say. And that is about appropriate for the real space shuttle. That is including extra mop propellant tanks here, mop propellant and docking port. So we've got some extra mop propellant, propellant, propellant involved and mop propellant in the cockpit as well. And those are handy, by the way, the fact that I put these here and that there, uh, just in case we need to balance this out and make sure that the center mass is for the center lift. I should show that. This is its current uh, center mass and center lift. The center mass never goes behind the center of lift, but it can be fairly far forward at times. But once it's uh, removed its payload, then it should be all right. If it's carrying a really heavy payload, it really can't come back down. There's a payload limit to how much the shuttle can carry on the way back down. And in general, you'd want that as far back as possible. As you can see, no matter how far back you put a payload in here, it'll never move the center of mass uh, behind the center of lift. There are also body flaps, and those not only are just to protect the engines, but eventually they were used for control as well on the real space shuttle. I only have them set active to pitch. This is set just to pitch. This is pitch and roll. We don't really need that much authority. We could probably tune them down. There are actually two fins here. You might be able to see one, two. And that is because, and I, I stole this idea from EJ, I think, uh, also on Twitch. And that is because when you deploy them, let's try and uh, show that, you get the shuttle's split air brake kind of thing. So the way the shuttle does braking is by splitting its rudder like that. Okay, so that covers all the basics of the shuttle. Oh, and RCS thrusters, just to be legit about it, make sure your RCS thrusters actually clear other things, you know? They're not blowing at other things, it's really unsightly. And so that's why you have these little things extending them out. You can make those look prettier. But yeah, that's so that the RCS thrusters aren't blowing at the wings. You'll know another a thruster here, and that's because if you have just this one, it's above the center of mass, so this one counterbalances it. Uh, you'll note that uh, these two are actually in line with the center of mass, and so I put two to make sure there's as much power there as there is here. Actually, uh, technically I could only put, I should just put one, because leverage-wise, this is a much longer lever arm and so they really do have a lot of power and just one would probably counterbalance that. Uh, you can see uh, it's just I didn't use the Werner thrusters because again this doesn't carry liquid fuel and oxidizer it only carries mop propellant and so I use these linear RCS ports all over the place uh, two facing up there, two facing forward that's the downward facing one there and there and again, I don't want to put any on the bottom because that's not doesn't seem really legitimate. The real shuttle does not have RCS ports on the bottom. And that is because heat. Heat would be bad. Okay. Oh, uh, you might uh, have trouble with the landing gear. Uh, the way you should place those, I've come to find out. Uh, I forget who mentioned this to me. Uh, put it on the body, not on the wing. 
and then tweak them out like that. That seems to be the most stable arrangement and the lightest weight arrangement available. So that's how I did it here. And as with all planes, you want to make sure that the wheels are close to the center mass but behind it. And it's convenient to make sure that that's in line with the center of lift in this case because we know from the configuration and what I've discussed so far that the center mass in this case never goes behind that line. So we're all good. All right, let's go to the VAB and see how to integrate this with a stack. All right, here we are, and I'm going to sneak in the MechJeb part so you can see the numbers. All right, so uh, it's, it's a little bit complicated. <laughs> uh, we have our payload fuel tank here locked, so maximum payload for this is 36 tons, which is the mass of that. Let's close that up. And I haven't changed anything else about the vehicle, the shuttle. Everything is as you saw it in the SBH. And then what I did was I added the external fuel tank here, mounting point here. And the external fuel tank has no controls. It has no Verners. It has no uh, SAS units or reaction wheels. It does have a... I, I added a docking port there. And that's just in case I want to try and actually get this to orbit and use it for some reason. Uh, we have that option. But we'll have to have a space tug rendezvous with it and grab it and to do stuff. But also, th th there could be other fancy stuff for that. Uh, if you don't want to put that on, you could just put, uh, like, probably the best thing to do is this Rocket Max brand adapter. We'll uh, seal it off and... Maybe you could use a small docking port, or you could just put a nose cone down there. Anyway, but the important thing about the external tank is that you have the right fuel flow priority. And what you want to do is, and if you don't know how to turn on those things, it's in the settings menu, and you want advanced tweakables. And so right now, the higher the number, that's the tank that will pull out of first. Now, given where the fuel line is here, normally it would actually pull from this tank first, then this tank, then this tank, then this tank. Instead, what I want is for it to pull from this one first and that one last. And that is because that will leave the center of mass as high as possible. And the higher it is, the easier it is for these engines to control it. If the center mass ends down here, these, the thrust of this, does not go through it. Uh, we can show the center mass here. Now it's very low. Right now, if we tried to just try to balance this with these engines, it wouldn't be able to because the thrust line, center thrust, well, the thrust line right now is going through it thanks to our boosters. But if these boosters were not firing and only these main engines were firing, the thrust line would go through about here. And again, that's why we needed a 10 degree tilt. They also have the huge gimbling, so that helps. So the center mass could be like anywhere around here, thanks to the gimbling, but it really couldn't be down here. So there, it's only down here because we have the boosters on. If we didn't have the boosters on, it'd be higher and safe. But in any case, we would want to drain from this tank first. And you note, we have this tank a little bit uh, underfilled because we don't want the thrust weight ratio once the boosters are done to be too low. And if you have to empty any tank, you want to do the bottom one, not the top one, because the top one is helping with the balance. So I've underfueled the bottom tank, set that one to a high fuel priority, this one one notch lower, this one one notch lower, and then that one. Okay, so that will be the last tank to be drained. All right, hopefully that's pretty clear. That is rather critical. The real space shuttle, the way that works, actually, now the real space shuttle, you figure, well, they can't possibly be draining the top last because there's only two tanks in there. There's a liquid hydrogen tank and a liquid oxygen tank. The way it works in the real shuttle is that the liquid hydrogen tank, hydrogen is very, uh, very not dense. <laughs> uh, it, it actually takes up a huge amount of the tank and it's very light. The oxygen, however, takes up only a small amount of the tank and it's really heavy. So they put that on top, the liquid oxygen tank, and that's the way it manages to counterbalance and make sure that the center of mass is high. 
it's pretty much critical for a spa American space shuttle like system, the one without any engines on the external tank, to have that be the case if you want to control it when the boosters separate. Uh, the time when you would have trouble controlling it is uh, late into the flight when the external tank is almost empty and then if the fuel is all the way down here things get really wobbly. Okay, so or just when the SRB sep if it could already be having a problem. If you find you have wobbles uh, when the SRB sep it might be because your center mass is in a bad place. All right, now about the SRBs. There are a number of ways to attach uh, a lot of SRBs like this. You'll need a lot of them unless your space shuttle is very light. In general, the space shuttle has up to 20% of the thrust on this side and 80% of the thrust on the SRBs. Um, you could have less thrust on the shuttle side uh, to a certain amount uh, consider about uh, plus or minus 5% kind of thing. So in general, the SRBs you want to have producing about four times as much thrust as your main engines. And in this case, my main engines are throttled down to 64%. And that's because otherwise they would produce too much thrust and then this would push that way. And uh, this right now produces just about the right balance. Uh, you note the, that this is not fully fueled, okay. I've done something a little bit clever here. In the real space shuttle, the solid fuel boosters sort of taper off their thrust as they go along. They don't have the same thrust all the way through. Unfortunately, in Kerbal Space Program, our solid boosters do have the same thrust all the way through. So I've put these clusters of seven SRBs. And uh, if you do the math, by the way, we've got three engines here producing 640 kilonewtons, and the SRBs here produce 670 kilonewtons each right and uh, if we want four times as much uh, well we have three producing about that much here and so we will want 12 producing as that much over there to have 80 percent of the thrust on this side and so we need six boosters in each cluster so i have seven and there is a reason i have seven first of all symmetry right uh to make it look right uh, and also to have a solid core in there instead of it being attached to nothing. But um, the center one, let me try and get the camera in here. Because of the thrust tail off, what I do is th this one, this one, this one, and this one have full fuel and full thrust. This one and this one have limited fuel, a little bit less. So they'll turn off first so that it'll have reduced thrust uh, close to when the SRB is going to set. This one in the center, we don't need really. Remember, we only needed 12 SRBs on the SRB side to counterbalance the main engines. What I've got here is it's got very low thrust and it's got uh, an amount of fuel to ensure that it continues running for just a little bit longer than everything else. So when we separate, this SRB, this center SRB is still going to be running because when the real space shuttle SRBs decouple, they still are running. They actually have 400 kilonewtons of thrust when they decouple from the space shuttle stack. And I wanted to simulate that. It has some side benefits, by the way. Uh, one side benefit is that uh, they clear a lot better. Uh, once you put the separatrons, you might want to take a good look at the way I have my separatrons. Uh, one pointing up here. Uh, 45 degree angle on these and make sure those are angled so that they don't actually you know blow up the space shuttle and then here below the space shuttle line so making sure that it doesn't hit the space shuttle though maybe it's angled at the vertical stabilizer a little bit but anyway uh, two down here so five little separatrons on each of the boosters these tanks are empty by the way that's just for looks uh, the, the, these are just solid fuel boosters. There's no liquid fuel component to it. Now, the real space shuttle takes eight minutes to get to orbit. Uh, to get to orbit in Kerbal Space Program takes about four minutes if you are using a space shuttle. And in this case, uh, we've got a little bit more than four minutes of fuel, four and a half minutes, let's say. The real shuttle's SRBs run for two minutes and three seconds. Our SRBs are already designed to run for a minute and two seconds or something like that. 
So relative to the size of Kerbin, uh, well, the time it takes to get into orbit around Kerbin compared to the time it takes to get around orbit around Earth, uh, our SRBs are actually time bright. So at one minute and about two seconds, we can expect to separate them. Uh, it's reading 1 minute and 18 seconds here because of that center booster, which will run for an extra amount of time with its little low thrust. The thrust weight ratio of this is about the same as the liftoff thrust weight ratio of the real shuttle, about 1.6. The real shuttle has better thrust weight ratio when the boosters separate. This one has 0.82, the real space shuttle has close to 1. And the real space shuttle has much higher thrust weight ratios on the max end of things. We are much more tame because Kerbin is a small planet. Anyway, everything else I think can be taken care of on launch. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. But I just wanted to show how this basically works. Okay, so let's launch this. Oh, uh, let's take the MechJet part out. We don't need that. I want to be completely snock about this. All right. Now again, uh, once the external tank is gone, we're not going to be using the main engines anymore. So I've action grouped the main engines to action group zero. The rudder, the split rudder, is action group eight. So when I press eight, that splits. You can also add a drogue chute to this if you have trouble landing it safely, if it's going too fast. Okay, SAS on, throttle up, and we're going to ignite the three main engines first. And you'll note that when we ignite the three main engines, it's going to push the stack a little bit this way. And then we will ignite the boosters and separate the launch clamps when it settles down, when it's back to vertical. Uh, like the actual space shuttle, I've only got launch clamps on the boosters. That's how the shuttle is. The entire shuttle stack is hanging off of the boosters. The boosters are the only parts that are actually... Um, connected to anything really, well except for umbilicals, you know. Uh, the way you do this is auto strutting, uh, so auto strut heaviest part is probably the best thing you want to do. Um, lots of auto strutting would be helpful. If you want, you can just use struts. Uh, would do the same sort of thing. You would need uh, a lot of struts to make sure that this remains stable. Alright, here we go. Ignition. Now the first thing you want to do is make sure it's actually going straight up and then of course the real shuttle doesn't roll. So it takes a bit of practice to make sure the roll is smooth and actually each shuttle will be a little bit different on that. You will probably be turning very quickly because there's a lot of power here, the thrust to weight ratio is high. You'll see two of the SRBs turn off, well, four of the SRBs, two on each end, turn off first. There they are. And as we get close to SRB SEP, I'll turn on RCS to help stabilize things. And SRB SEP. Well, that could have gone better. Um, it doesn't look like we lost anything, did we? Hmm. just goes to show we, we should do that again it doesn't seem right hold on this is the part where it could go really badly out of control if you have things badly balanced or if you're not keeping control over it um, yeah I want to try that again I want to try that again I am not satisfied Okay, here we go again. It's possible I was overdoing the flatness of it. 
let's try and be over 45 degrees. That's the first set of boosters. Sort of our cue to turn on RCS, I think. We want to be very close to prograde when the booster is set. Okay, they're clearly away now. And that's how it looks when they separate. That's really I'll quite like how they look when they separate. Oh boy. I made a little mistake in ah. This part takes a lot of practice. And RCS. I'm actually trying to go a little bit to one side of the 90 degree mark in order to get us back to our proper equatorial inclination. So at this point we have to keep an eye on our apoapsis and tantoapoapsis, but basically you can flatten out. Maybe a little bit. In general, staying close to prograde is not a bad thing, so maybe I'll tilt up a little bit. So there's always a bit of jitteriness after SRB set, and then the other point is when we're late into flight. There will be some issues. Once we get to 70 kilometers apoapsis, uh, flattening out is definitely necessary. So we're getting close to there, so I'm going to flatten out. And we can also throttle down. The real space shuttle thrall range is 67% to 100 and whatever they upgraded it to now. Uh, so usually the max is 109%. That's because over time they increase the power of the engines. And they start off with 100% of course. But anyway, so I, I generally don't go below two thirds because the real space shuttle can't do that. I want to go to 100 kilometer. Orbit. There's some uh, audio issues apparently. Yeah, that's weird. Okay, 101 kilometers by 3, and so. I think the RCS sounds are a little bit. There's some problems, at least in my earphones. Okay, uh, now there are no separatrons on the real external tank, so I didn't put them here. The way. Actually, what. Uh, we should have done is we should have rolled during the last phase of flight we should have rolled around oh I should still have RCS on here separated yep. separated and then used RCS to push away shut down the main engines and then I ignited the next stage, which is the OMS engines, and then power forward. Okay, and then off it goes. Now we're going to approach Apoapsis. But we need a lot of time to apoapsis. If you're using these puff engines, which is the which are the engines that are most like the OMS engines, then uh, well, it's gonna take a bit of time to make maneuvers, as it did with the real space shuttle. Real space shuttle takes many minutes to get into orbit and to deorbit, and to make any other maneuver. You'll note that the OMS engines are tilted. They are tilted so that they remain uh, pointed through the center of mass. The presumed center of mass is anywhere from here to over there. They do gimbal though, these little guys. So as long as it's anywhere in the middle of that range, they should be able to handle it without uh, using too much of the pitch authority. Otherwise the RCS has to fire all the time and you don't want that. We want a nice circular orbit because that will make it more predictable when we deorbit in order to come back down to the KSC. Now I haven't done flight testing and landing testing with this shuttle yet in 
so I don't know exactly how to deorbit. And since we can't really rely on our engines to help us in the atmosphere, well, it's going to be a little bit hard to hit the runway without practice. Once you've got the numbers down, once you've got the practice, then you'll be able to hit the runway just fine. But you have to know your numbers. So my guess is that from 100 kilometers, a circular 100 kilometer orbit, if I deorbit opposite of this peninsula, let's say right here, I should try to go to a 26 kilometer periapsis. And that's what I'm going to try for. I need to be a little bit radial to keep my apoapsis from drifting as I try and circularize here because we've already passed apoapsis. Don't forget to save some fuel for deorbiting and actually that's a handy thing. Uh, if you recall we have these these two containers up here. You might want to just lock those for uh, orbital maneuvers. Maybe even lock these guys here since we've got these huge tanks. Use those as the unnecessary fuel and then save these for coming back down. Well, I could have definitely made a nicer orbit of this. We will uh, we'll retro burn first and then get rid of the payload so it doesn't you know litter space or anything. Now it takes so long to do the burn, even though I want the periapsis to form on over that peninsula. We'll start retro burning here. That'll give it enough time for the OMS engines to do it, their trick. The liquid fuel and oxidizer, you see, liquid fuel and oxidizer you see here is the payload. By the way, there's only a tiny little bit in the in the little uh, what you call it, Oscar refuel tanks, which are for our fuel cell system. And rather than locking those, I just set their fuel priority to a really really low number. So the so the main engines will never draw from them. So that's uh, that's another way to go. Okay, retrograde. Now obviously not everybody has the patience for such a long deorbit burn. You can see our periapsis going down, you know, hundreds of meters at a time, but it, it takes a while. You may want to deviate from the normal shuttle design by simply putting more powerful engines here, which would also help with landing if you uh, if it turns out that you aren't quite hitting the runway you can then use those engines to help out you could uh, go ahead and uh, not do the mod propellant thing and instead just have liquid fuel and oxidizer in the shuttle just uh, be nice and not run these engines don't forget that they're tilted the wrong way and you'll end up spinning out anyway now if you want to do a Buran thing, which uh, would have engines on the external tank, then these nozzles can be straight out the back. You don't actually need really powerful engines on your shuttle side, on your orbiter, if you are doing it Buran style, but hey, uh, if, if you want to go long distance with stuff, you might as well have powerful engines there too. We will try this. Again, I don't know the right numbers for the KSP 1.2 atmosphere and all but we will take this as good enough and now is a good time to eject the dummy payload and of course with RCS we want to figure out how to push away from it that is the right way so now that will be deorbited safely okay so when hitting the atmosphere you want your pitch to be well first of all definitely go stability assist on it your pitch to be about 40 degrees up. So like that. The real shuttle uh, used 38 to 45 depending on how exactly its approach was was. So 38 to get more lift it was if it was going short, 45 if it needed more drag if it was going long and so it would adjust itself like that. Uh, for KSP, Kerbin is such a short, well such a small planet 
that you might need to be more dynamic about it. So you could probably go anywhere from 30 to 50. In fact, just accidentally you might go 30 to 50 because it's tough to hit the exact number anyway. But again, pitching up gives you more drag. Pitching down gives you more lift. So if you find yourself going long, pitch up. If you find yourself going short, pitch down. And 40 degrees is your, uh, uh, assuming you have the same sort of shape, about even. The goal of pitching up like this is to slow down as much as possible. One of the reasons the shuttle had wings like this is so that it could potentially roll in order to correct its inclination. So you'll see here that we're actually heading a little bit too far north there. So the real shuttle could, even during this phase, tilt somewhat like this. And then the atmosphere hitting it would help it to turn. In KSP, I don't know how well it works. High in the atmosphere, of course, most of your control is uh, thanks to RCS. Low in the atmosphere, your control surfaces are more important. I don't generally lock my control surfaces in stock. In realism overhaul with a realistic shuttle, I would totally lock those control surfaces, or with ferrum aerospace. It's better to lock the control surfaces because otherwise on launch they tend to rip off. But as you saw, there's no risk of that in stock. So here's the thick of it, if you will. We are now slowing down, tilting a bit. I've pitched down because, well, it's tough to say, but I think uh, that's being brought in quicker than I need it to be. So I'm, I'm pitching to 35-ish to get a little bit more lift. You can see we've used about half of our pitch authority right now, so that's good. You don't want to ever see that maxed out, otherwise you know you're close to losing control. Can't say we've done a lot to bring it further south. I guess it's a little bit better. Well, now we're maxing out pitch. Oh. Sometimes, at least. We might be overshooting. Yeah, we're probably overshooting, aren't we? Now, without, you know, proper engines, this does not have too much ability to turn around. One thing we should do is dump mod propellant. The little engines don't provide much thrust to weight ratio in the atmosphere, but we could lighten our load at least. So, the space shuttle actually does dump its fuel, and basically that's what we're doing. I certainly don't want to go any further in this direction. At a certain point, it makes sense to pitch down. And, in fact, at a certain point, you'll be forced to pitch down. And the normal uh, pitch down for a shuttle, uh, it pitches down about negative 20 degrees. So, when the time is right, when it's possible to make a maneuver at all. Right now, if I try to turn, uh, you'll see that the prograde vector is not willing to come along with me. See? So there's no point trying to turn right now. They will just unstabilize the shuttle. But at a certain point, it will be possible to turn this thing. Not right now. <laughs> okay, I think it's starting to come along with me here. So let's pitch down. Let's continue dumping fuel. I think we might be closer to the island runway, actually. I have not tried to land a shuttle on the island runway possibly ever. But you can see how quickly this loses velocity, by the way. This is the flying like a brick thing. Yeah, I think getting to island runway is probably going to be wishful thinking, too. Come on, minus 20 degrees. Well, I guess this could be, in a way, instructive. During your space shuttle flight testing, you will inevitably need to splash down. And so we can demonstrate how that should work out. First of all, as you can see, we're dumping fuel. 
So again, negative 20 degrees. That's our normal flight path. That's in order to keep the velocity, otherwise you're gonna lose the velocity very quickly. You only want to pull up like right at the end. And then you want to level out and dump the velocity so we're not going so fast when we actually hit the surface. And we have to make sure not to stall. In my experience, we tend to lose the nose cone but everything else tends to be alright. Okay, well that's a splashdown. I'll have to work on how to get the numbers right in KSP 1.2 and deorbit it successfully, but hey, we're not, we're not insanely far off. It'll just take a little bit of tweaking and timing and it should be okay. Alright, so there you have it. That is your advanced tutorial on the space shuttle. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.